Today we are here to recognize and honor the brave men of our Yonkers Police Department. On Sunday evening, four off-duty and two on-duty members of the YPD and one very brave young man uh, came to the rescue of two passengers of a downed plane on the Hudson River just off the shores of Yonkers. I'm also joined here by our fire commissioner. Uh, Bob, do you want to come up? Bob Sweeney. With below freezing temperatures and blocks of ice lining the Hudson River, Yonkers finest came to aid, came to the aid of Christopher Schmidt and Denise Koch. These officers took it upon themselves to secure a boat. Does that mean commandeer? <laughs> okay. Uh, to secure a boat uh, from the nearby Hudson River boathouse, uh, and they were able to rescue the individuals after they spent close to 30 minutes in the water. Now, anyone who knows anything about hypothermia knows you don't get much more time than that if it's probably the other way around. Uh, it's acts like this that make the Yonkers Police Department the finest in the nation. I also want to acknowledge the other emergency responders. They came and aided the rescue. Uh, our bravest, the Yonkers Fire Department, were there as well, and that's why we acknowledge the Commissioner Sweeney, uh, the New York State Police, the NYPD uh, from New York City, uh, the fire department from New York City, FDMY, and, and of course, our, we should never forget the county police, Westchester County Police, especially the courageous 911 dispatcher who calmly guided Christopher and Denise through those initial moments and I'm sure contributed greatly to saving their lives. So before we acknowledge these brave, uh, I want to invite the Yonkers Police Commissioner Gardner to come up here and say a few words. Commissioner? Thank you, Mayor. What I'm going to do is give you a chronology of events on what occurred on Sunday, and then I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. So on Sunday, January 27th, at about 5.20 p.m., the Yonkers Police Department began receiving several 911 calls reporting that a small plane had just landed in the Hudson River, just south of the Greystone Station. We also learned that one of the two occupants of the plane had contacted a police dispatcher, as the mayor just mentioned, who spoke to the occupants, tried to calm them down, um, and instruct them to put on their, their flotation devices and assured them that help was on the way. Numerous Yonkers police and fire units responded to the scene and began staging in the area. Uh, both occupants of the plane, a 39-year-old female and 49-year-old male who's joining us here this, morning, this afternoon, were able to get out of the plane before it completely submerged in the center of the Hudson River. And they were floating southbound in the river with flotation devices in the frigid water. At about the same time, off-duty Yonkers police officers Dan Higgins, with Dan Jr., his 12-year-old son, officers Joseph Mahoney, John Toomey, and retired detective George Farrell were together in the area and became aware of the situation. Uh, Dan Higgins and George Farrell, should be noted, are licensed boat captains and former members of the Yonkers Police Department Marine Unit. Uh, this group, realizing that there were no rescue boats immediately available in the area, responded to the Hudson River Pilot Boat Association, and they gained access to a pilot boat. Uh, we didn't say commandeered, we gained access to the boat. <laughs> and were joined by on-duty police officers Chris Balazentis and Mike Atkins as that they began to search for victims. Uh, with total disregard for their own safety, they located the victims by hearing their voices coming from the freezing water. They immediately began uh, after rescuing them and pulling them from the water, they began administering first aid as they were suffering from hypothermia, and Dan Higgins Jr. actually gave one of the individuals his coat. They were taken to shore, where they were met by Yonkers police and fire personnel, uh, provided treatment and transported to Jagobi Hospital, and I'm very pleased to say that both have been released from the hospital, and we're very happy to see Chris here with us this afternoon. Uh, as a result of the quick actions, training, and ability to adapt, with total disregard for their own safety, they were able to successfully locate and rescue two individuals from the frigid waters. Their selfless, selfless actions most certainly saved the lives of these two people. I think this is an example of the heroic deeds of these individuals, as well as members of our department, who are willing to put themselves in harm's way to protect the people in our community. I'm very proud of each and every one of them, and I believe they are very deserving of this noteworthy recognition this afternoon. I'd also like to thank the members of the other agencies, the fire department, the fire commissioner is joining us, and I also want to thank the mayor 
for his continued support and for providing us with this recognition here this afternoon. Now open it up. Wait. For, Wait. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess before we open up the questions, I'd like to uh, ask you, at least someone from the city council to say a few words. So I'm asking council president, Chuck Lesnick, if you'd like to say a couple of words. This is not our day. This is the men in blue and, and, and the people who really came forward. Uh, you know, as council members, we just follow the mayor's lead and put money into the budget and make sure that the right equipment and the right training is there. And uh, I know the, the commissioner and his, and his staff prepare uh, for every eventuality, uh, but, but really this is, this is their day. Uh, the other council members who wanted to be here, uh, Christopher Johnson, uh, Michael Breen, John Larkin and Dennis Shepard. Unfortunately, this is a part-time job for those of you from New York City, so they're not always here, but they also send their, their congratulations and their best wishes. Thank you, Council President. And with that, I'd like to, uh, again, I know that Christopher was introduced, and I want to say it's, a, it's an honor for you to be here with us today. And, it's uh, an honor to be here, sir. Yes. And, uh, but we'll, we'll do Q&A in a second. But in the meantime, I'd like to get the officers Again, these, these were selfless acts of bravery. And uh, this is a, a moment where we can recognize our bravest uh, for going above and beyond and doing, and actually answering the call of duty of taking care of their fellow man and woman. And I'd like to uh, ask uh, Police Officer Dan Higgins to come up. We have a proclamation here recognizing your efforts. <laughs> say congratulations. Now, got to make sure we take care of Dan Higgins, Jr. <laughs> Daniel E. Higgins II. Congratulations. Uh, police officer John Tomei. I guess when you're retired, you're never really retired. <laughs> so, uh, detective retired George Farrell. <laughs> uh, police officer Christopher Balazentis. With that, we'll open up to the commissioner here, and uh, Christopher's here, and the police officer's here. Are there any questions from the press? Yes, um, I have a question for um, Chris. I know a lot of us, as I said, as I said heard your nine long call, but can you tell us a little bit about um, what it was like? I understand you guys were on a sightseeing trip, has been described as. Um, can you tell us about that afternoon and how things proceeded and what happened? It started out as a normal flight for us. Uh, we hit the corridor, you know, it, it, was, it was actually very nice, you know, the sun was starting to set, we passed the Freedom Tower, and um, I don't know New York that well, so I can't give anybody a, a distance, but, you know, it was a certain amount of time later, we started to experience, you know, the only thing I'll say was trouble with the plane. Uh, Denise, who I, I give the first amount of credit to, because without her skills, this story would be going a different way. She compensated, got the plane back to, to an altitude that was good. Uh, a very, very short while, I, I'm talking within a minute, the plane started to experience the same problem and we looked at each other, we, we knew the plane was gonna go down. Uh, we were over land at that time, I guess at that point we were over Yonkers and um, she did a great job of, of, I mean, she instructed me what to do, what she was doing, be prepared, we're definitely going down and she got that plane into the middle of the Hudson and I couldn't ask for a better landing. That landing that she did was the first part of this, this rescue operation. She initially saved our lives. Any other way that plane would have come down, it was not gonna be the same story. How worried were you that you would make it that safely? 
there was no fear involved. I wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid. There was absolutely no panic, which in the beginning she said the first thing was don't panic. And usually what's the first thing somebody's going to do? They're going to panic. There was no panic. There was no fear. You know, the questions going through my mind were, you know, what's it going to feel like to hit, you know, how hard are we going to hit? And if we hit the water or when we hit the water, is it survivable? That was the first part. And once we got through that, I said, okay, the plane's down. You know, we, are, we did start taking on water right away, at which point I made a couple phone calls, one to the 911 dispatcher who did a great job, and uh, we took it from there. Uh, who called, who'd you call besides me? Uh, first call went to my family. It was very, it was very brief. Uh, my daughter answered the phone. I told her to put my wife on. And I said, don't say anything. I said, just listen. I said, we did crash in the Hudson. The plane is taken on water. I said, tell the kids I love them. I, I said, I have to go. And I hung up the phone. You know, probably not uh, the phone call any wife wants to hear. But, you know, I did make that call and then immediately got on the phone with 911 dispatcher. And uh, I was on the phone with them until until I was actually submerged in the water, and at which point, you know, the phone was just no good. It's one thing to, um, to tell yourself not to panic, but when you hit that water, you felt the cold. Did your mind just stop? Everything went blank. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, when the plane had started to originally fill up with water, unbeknownst to me, it was actually coming in through the, uh, what appeared, I guess it was coming in through the, through the uh, front. So the water was actually passing the motor and heating up. I said, wow, this isn't that bad. I said, okay, we could do this. We could swim to shore. Once I exited the plane and was fully, sub once the plane's wing went down, I was fully submerged. And uh, I was still on the phone at that point. I guess you could tell there was a little bit difference in my voice. There was a little bit difference in the call. And, Everything was out the window. I knew, I, I knew as soon as I was submerged, I was not going to swim the shore. What's it like 30 minutes in that freezing water? Nothing I wish on anybody. I, 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 five more minutes, uh, it would be a different story. I knew my body was starting to shut down. Um, I could no longer swim. I couldn't paddle anymore. Uh, I, I was just at the mercy of the current. And, you know, I, I knew it wasn't much, much left of me. Tell us about the moment when you first saw the boat approaching you and what was going through your mind. Relief, I guess will be the first thing. I was very relieved. Uh, I actually heard the boat before I saw it, at which point I, I definitely said, all right, you know, this, this is going to be a happy ending. Uh, I saw the boat. I heard people yelling. I don't think I could comprehend what was being said. Uh, I know the life ring was tossed to me. Who, th who threw the life ring to me? Uh, did, did, did I say anything at that point? I, I don't think at that point I could even let go of my life preserver. Uh, I was just, my hands were frozen, my feet were frozen, but somehow I, I did manage to grab it and they, uh, you know, they, they pulled me into the boat. They, they, these guys, every, everybody up here, you know, they're, they're all heroes. Everybody who, let me, let me rephrase that, everybody who responded, NYPD, the fire departments, EMS, uh, I did see the helicopter about the same time I saw the boat. They're all my heroes. These, these guys, you know, it's, it's different when the shoe's on the other foot and you're being thanked for something, but now it's, it's, it's my turn because I wasn't going to last much longer. I, that water was just it, too much. 30 minutes in that water, I'll, I don't think I need cold water for a while. What was Denise's condition like? Were you guys speaking to one another? Uh, she was speaking more to me uh, until I actually saw the emergency vehicles responding and they were in my, my line of sight. Then I became very boisterous and loud. And could you guys on the boat hear me? Did you guys on the boat hear me? I couldn't hear you. I know there were, I was told that there were only certain access points to get down to that area so I could see them stopping in multiple spots. And I just kept, I just kept yelling and yelling and yelling. And the first sign of relief after that was when I, I heard somebody say, they know you're there, you know, they're coming. So that, that was. That was the first sign. Okay, all right, we're good. What but, was she saying to you? Trying to keep you calm, make sure you stay together. Um, we had got somehow she had gotten fairly far ahead of me, and the current ended up taking me southward, where she was more towards the uh, the shore. Uh, at one point, I just said, "You know what? It's it's fight or flight," and I started kicking, and I I actually passed her. I'm like, "Come on, let's go," you know, "Let's go," and that's when actually the boat had, had arrived.
When you were rescued, um, how close were the two of you together? Um, to my best recollection, we were probably within 25 feet or so. I mean, there was, there was one point where she was probably about 75 yards ahead of me, and I, I just, I couldn't even catch up at that point. The current was, like I said, was taking me south. She was more inland, and she had told me, she goes, I'm almost there. I don't think she realizes how far she still was. Um, but I, like I said, I eventually did catch up to her. Have you heard the transmissions or the conversations of the 911 call? Have you heard them play on television or anything? I've heard some of it. And can you believe that is you and frankly how calm you remained? Uh, once the plane touched down, you know, I didn't realize how cold the water would be. Once I realized, all right, listen, neither one of us is, is severely injured. We're going to make it out of here. And we didn't panic on the way down. Like I said, there was no fear. There was no panic. We got down. Once the plane actually came to rest, um, you know, it was till that water hit, that's when everything went out the window. Everything was just completely out the window. But staying calm, the only way to relay the message to the 911 dispatcher is to remain calm. Give the, I gave her as many fixation points as I could. Um, the only thing I recall that might have scared me a little bit is, I believe it was the Al Alpine Tower. When I had said Alpine Tower, she, maybe she was a little, like she didn't know where it was, or maybe I didn't say it where she understood me. I don't know. Uh, the call was, you know, I was just trying to get stuff through. And my other big concern was, which actually when I spoke to one of the detectives, I knew that plane was going to be submerged. I didn't want them to come and say, this is another prank call. You know, I mean, it was cold. I wanted to get out of that water. And, uh, but Denise did a great job. You know, we, we tried to stay together for the most part, and we just we remained as calm as we could. Well, she's my flight. I'm a student pilot. She's my flight instructor. She had just purchased the plane uh, within a few days. She called me up and said, do you want to go for a flight? I was like, absolutely, let's go. Uh, a normal flight, she picked me. She left Robbinsville, she picked me up in Old Bridge, uh, gave me a couple choices, and I said, you know what, let's, let's go fly New York. I, I've never flown over New York. And we did. So, I mean, yes, as, as far as it was, it was normal for us. Had you been on that plane before, or was that your first time? Uh, it was actually my second time in that plane. I went with her and the previous owner on, uh, on the flight where she wanted to uh, possibly purchase it. So that was actually the second flight I was on that plane. So this was about a lesson or anything? I'm sorry. Any problems on that first? No, no, none, none at all. None at all. So this wasn't a lesson, it was just go up for fun? No, th this wasn't an instructional lesson. She, uh, I mean, although she's a commercial pilot and she's an excellent pilot, uh, she still had to get acclimated to the plane. She said, you'll eventually be flying this. You know, it, let's just go for a nice flight. Of course, you know, I, I try and get up anytime I can. I like being up in the air. Did you have any concerns about this plane? I think it, it's at least 50 years old. It's a 1967, and uh, actually when I heard it was a 1967, I was a little, you know, like, why would anybody want a plane that old? But seeing that the condition it was kept in, and we had actually had a, a conversation with the mechanic who, I mean, A rating on the plane. The, the plane was, was not, didn't appear at any time to have any problems whatsoever. Do you or she have any idea what did go wrong? No. Have you spoken to her about that? No. Have you spoken to her at all? I, I've sp I spoke to her this morning. She did get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to clean her house. Uh, she wanted to be here to say thank you to everybody. Uh, she'll do that in her own time. Um, but, I mean, as far as the plane, I, I really, it is under investigation with the NTSB and the FAA, so I, re I really can't give you what I may or may not think happened because I'm not, I'm not qualified to make that call. Are you planning on going up again? Absolutely. When you made that call to your wife and uh, you told her to tell the kids that um, I always know in the back of my mind there's always a possibility of something negative happening. At that moment, no, I didn't think I was. Uh, that thought obviously changed after about 10, 15 minutes in the water. I, I was, at one point, I, I was ready to, to, to stop. I mean, it was very, very cold. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything anymore.
Were you over the river when the plane got into trouble or the chief directed? No, we were actually over, uh, over land, uh, not far from the water. I believe we made a 30 degree bank into, uh, into, the, into the water. You steered into the water because it was safer? Uh, it was easier to get to the water and not risk hitting anything on the ground. Obviously, you hope if you hit the water, it's a softer impact. You know, you don't know if you, you know, in that situation, again, I'm, I'm not a full-fledged pilot. You know what? She made the right choice. She landed it perfectly. And we are here today to talk about it. That's it for questions. Do you have any more? Uh, we can get on one-on-one -on -one basis. Well, I think we want to hear from the officers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, just, just so you know, too, last week we had a press conference with the commissioner where Yonkers was, uh, you know, deemed it's one of the safest cities of its size in America. Matter of fact, we're in the top 10. So it's nice to see that that, this, the, that, that extends beyond our shores and into the Hudson River as well. So um, are there any questions uh, for the police officers? Well, Officer and, Higgins and, uh, and uh, Dan Jr., can you tell us um, at the microphone, please, uh, uh, what were you doing yesterday? What was your day? And what were you planning? And how did it all end up for you? Uh, yesterday was a lot of phone calls. And uh, a lot of people want to interview us. And, um, you know, it was just answering the phone constantly all day. Uh, but I, I, I'm sorry, I meant the day before. What were you doing uh, with, with your son you know, when this happened? Sunday, yes. Uh, th that afternoon we were coming down from a trip upstate. We went ice fishing for the weekend. And um, we had our cars parked at, the, uh, mm -hmm. at Tower Jock Club, uh, the group that went up. And we were all there just unloading our gear. Um, Detective Farrell over there received the call, and um, we all just said, hey, let's go try to help these guys. Did you see, did you see Detective Farrell? Um, did he come find you? How did no, we were all at the boat club together. Okay. Had you all been ice fishing together? Um, some of us, um, except for George. Mm -hmm. Danny Jr., what was it like for you to um, be in this situation and help these people. What was it like? Can you tell us? Uh, I, I don't know. It, it feels good that I actually help these people. And uh, I'm just glad that they're alive. Does this, uh, would you like to follow in, uh, follow in your dad's footsteps and become an officer, or has this cured you of uh, <laughs> first responders? Well, I would like to go into Annapolis, the Naval Academy, and then, and then I would like to fall into the police department. Can you tell us again, Danny, what role that you played, what you did? You gave, uh, I think the commissioner said you gave one of, one of the survivors your coat. Can you just tell us? Well, I saw that he was shaking, his hands were shaking, and he was like, so I took off my jacket. And I gave it to him, and he wrapped it around his hands so he wouldn't freeze. Can you describe for us, both of you, um, what it was like from your perspective when you got there, you're trying to rescue them. Did you worry that you weren't going to make it in time? And can, were you hearing them calling out to you? Well, I was driving the boat, so I couldn't hear anything. But the guys on deck, uh, we had them stationed around the boat as lookouts. In that condition of light, um, ice in the water, you, you know, it was a lot to consider. I was more afraid of run them, running them over because I was afraid that they couldn't call out to us. So thank God they were able to do that. And once we identified where they were, it was, easy, it was a little bit easier to get a light on them and position the boat properly where we can um, get them aboard. Is that kind of like finding a needle in a haystack and you go the river like that or is that going? Well, as my son said, more like a hay factory. <laughs> <laughs> Given how cold the water was, how good did you think the chances were of uh, rescuing these people? Very slim. Very slim because, you know, it's just hard to conduct a search under those conditions when you can't see. You know. Can you describe the current for us? Very fast. It's the Hudson River. And, Any uh, estimate on how quick the current is? I couldn't give uh, up. At least 10 to 12 knots. Who was speaking with the 911 operator? Um, not me. I think George, you come in on the radio? No? No, I didn't have a chance to speak to him. How old are you? I'm 12. 
And who was the first officer to see the plane fall in the Hudson? Did anybody see it or hear about it? He's not here today. Yeah, no, I didn't see it. We, we did have two officers that responded that observed the tail of the plane before it went down. So we had some idea of the, the general location of where the plane was going, where it initially was submerged. Just one, one question for Chris, if you, if you may. When the plane, when you put the plane down in the water, if you can stand by the microphone, just, just one quick question. Did you think this is a Sully Sullenberger moment and I'm living it? <laughs> yeah. I did think about that after, and if anybody's got any pull, Denise and I would love to meet him. <laughs> uh, again, the, he, he's an, another one, he's an absolute hero for what he did with the plane. But no, we're, we're, we're comparing two totally different aircrafts. Um, so a couple people I spoke with said the survival rate of a, a small single engine airplane hitting the water is far lesser than the rate of you know, fatality. So, I mean, the only thing I could keep saying is everything was in place, the stars were aligned for us. From, from her setting that plane down, the, the way she did, and the response that we got, you know, that's the only reason we're here. Like I said, a few more minutes would have made a big difference, and I can't thank the, any of these guys enough. And I think Junior here underestimates, you know, himself and what he did. I don't think he realizes the severity, and I don't say that in a condescending way. Uh, I remember seeing him, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this guy's pretty young to be a cop. <laughs> but um, you know what? And I think he wanted to give me his jacket, and did he ask you for permission? Or you said, go ahead and give it to him? I'm, I'm not even sure. You know what? It was, I was like, man, just give me that jacket, kid. Let's go. <laughs> but he, every, everybody here, they, they did a fantastic job. I cannot thank them enough. Everybody who was involved in the rescue mission, I cannot thank them enough. Any of the agencies involved. They, they all need to be commended for what they did. I have two, a 10-year-old son who's sitting right there, and my daughter's 12. She wanted to go to school. She wanted no part of this. <laughs> Where do you live? Uh, we're in Woodbridge, in New Jersey. Woodbridge. Where moved the younger? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. Are there any spots in the police department? What do you do? I'm a correction, correctional sergeant in Union County. Yes, sir. Do you intend to go ahead and get your pilot's license? Do I still intend? Um, absolutely. You know, it is, this has been a slow process. It's not something I was ever rushing. I mean, I've been flying with Denise for about a year and a half. Uh, I got posed the question yesterday, is this, you know, now it's, it's done? I said no. I was asked how long it's going to be before I get back in the air, you know, it's a couple weeks. You know, it's when she gets another plane, we'll be back up in the air. Hopefully Yonkers will never get this call again, you know. <laughs> is it possible to get your wife to stand next to you and your son? You <laughs> can all get a, and Yes, uh, tell us about receiving the phone call from your husband, what was going through your mind when you heard that. Uh, as I said before, my son and I, were we were resting, um, he wasn't feeling well. My daughter picked up my cell phone, said, it's dad, and I picked up the phone and he said, um, Kara, we, the plane crashed in the Hudson, and um, I love the kids, you know, I, I gotta go, I gotta call 911, and um, then the phone went dad, and then I, I Panicked myself a little bit, but I called 911 myself, my local 911, gave them as much information as I knew, and they sent an officer to my house um, to get me the information that they were being brought to the Jacoby Hospital. Did you think you'd ever see him again? We go through this quite a bit. Yeah, she can't get rid of it. Easy. He's got more than nine lives. We've, we've gone through this, not this extent, but more than once, so um, I can't get rid of him. <laughs> what was going through your head when you got that call? Um, I don't know. He's a survivor. He, he always manages to make it out alive. I, I don't know what else to say, you know. So I had to remain calm for my children. I could have had it for them, too. Because my daughter doesn't like all this attention at all. So I thank these guys for saving him. Good. 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 Good.
that announcement, and this was in the works prior to this incident occurring, that Officer Higgins is being appointed a detective on Thursday night. Thank you.